Okay, so um, my name is Jan Jensen, and I'm a, a chemist here in the chemistry department. And uh, Gemma and Kim, as I said, have asked me to talk a little bit about uh, blogging and Twitter and social media in general. And so I've prepared a couple of presentations, and may have seen the slides already. But I'd really more like a discussion. So if you have any questions, you know, while I'm talking, just interrupt. Um, but let me give you a little bit of, so why am I here talking about blogging? And so we're going to start with blogging. Uh, and that's because um, I've been blogging now for a long time. Um, so this, I have three blogs. This is my first blog. The, the, well, the one I started first, so you can see that's the first uh, post in 2009. Uh, and so that's a, a blog about, uh, that I started because I was writing a book. Uh, on my field, which is molecular modeling and computational chemistry. And so there was a bunch of stuff I couldn't put in the book, and so I wanted to, to put it in the blog instead. Um, and so that's a blog related, it has a specific topic, so it's related to computational chemistry and the idea is to um, sort of help people out with that. But um, then in a few years later, a couple of years later, I started another blog. So I didn't abandon the other blog. I'm, I run the two uh, simultaneously. And, and the reason I started the other blog is basically because um, I sort of made the mistake of starting a blog on a particular subject. And there was a lot of other stuff I wanted to write about. And I'll show you some examples. Right? But they didn't fit in this blog I started. So this, this blog has a very general title could sort of be about anything. You know? uh, so here I really write about anything uh, related to my work. Uh, and so you can see, yeah, so I started that um, in 2011. And then I started another blog <laughs> uh, a year later. And that was, uh, this is a community blog. So I'm not the only one writing uh, here. And the purpose of this blog is to highlight interesting papers in computational chemistry. So it's kind of a journal club. Uh, and so we pick interesting, uh, I've invited a bunch of people to join, and we pick interesting uh, papers to talk about. So again, that's another sort of very specific uh, purpose blog. And so this is actually sort of, I would say, the boundary between a blog and a journal. <coughs> but OK, so, so why, uh, why do I do this? Uh, and so first and foremost, I do it for myself. Um, so it, it's, you know, blogging is basically writing, right? And so why are we writing? Ultimately, we're actually writing, I think, in most cases for ourselves. It looks like we're writing to other people. We're writing a, a proposal that someone has to see um, and, and judge, or we're writing a paper that someone reviews, right? But we're also writing things down so we remember later. We put a lot of work into this. So let's say you weren't writing a paper or you weren't writing a, uh, a thesis or anything like that. I, I, my point is you would still write, right? Because you spent, if you're doing your master's, you spent a year on a research project. And eventually you're finishing that and you're going to do something else. And if you don't write it down, all of that will be lost, also to yourself. Right? There's no way you can remember. You can remember basically the deed, the main picture of what you did, maybe the main result. Right? But there's no way you will remember every little thing you did during that year. Right? And so if you want to remember that, you have to write it down. Um, but it's also, as you'll discover when you're writing your thesis or when you're writing a proposal, writing it down helps you get it straight in your head. Right? So I know very few people who sort of get it straight in their head first, and then they just sit down and write what's in their head. 
right? They just write down what <laughs> they have thought. When you write, you think. And when you have to put it in sentences, it forces you to be sort of very precise and detailed, right? And if that's tough, and that's tough for most people, right? If that's tough, that means it's not straight in your head, right? So it helps you, it's a way of helping you think in a, in a, in a more sort of structured manner. Or it could be a way to figure out, well, is it straight in my head, right? It's a test. If you sit down and write it down, and it's, it just flows out, then it was straight in your head. But if it's not just flowing out, then it wasn't straight in your head. Mm -hmm. right? And so that's, uh, blogging is a good way of doing this in little short pieces, right? So blogging is typically very short. It's something you can write in a few hours. Uh, it's, maybe, I mean, it's, so it's not really, you don't print it out, but if you printed it out, right, it would usually be at most a page. Right? So it's a, it's a limited subject that about something that you want to get straight into your head. So I'll show you an example of that. Okay. But that's the most important thing. Okay. There are other reasons, though. <clears throat> so one is to, to – so you could the, – the thing I just said, right, you could just open a Word file and write there, and once it's all written down, it's straight in your head, and you can save your Word file, and you can go whenever you forgot or remind yourself. So a blog, of course, you put it out publicly. Okay. And so the reason for that is to get feedback, for example. So is my thinking correct about this? Did I make a mistake? Or just what do other people think? Do they agree with the conclusion or not? Um, but, for example, if Let's say no one reads your blog, and that will almost certainly happen in the beginning, right? The point is it's not wasted, right? Because it, you got it straight in your head. Um, other reasons I blog is to get something out of my head. So you read something that really bothers you, let's say, or you get mad or, or something like that. And I don't know, you probably all has a, this experience, right? That you, you, you catch yourself thinking about it a lot, probably more than you should. Right? And then you mumble to yourself. And, uh, really shouldn't be. Right? So one, at least for me, one way to get it out of my head is simply to write it down. Right? This is what I'm mad about. This is why I'm mad about it. I don't do this very often, but sometimes I do. And once you have it sort of out on paper, in quotation mark, then it's sort of out of your head. And that can be very useful sometimes. And the last thing, which is sort of what I started with, it's, it's just, it's written down somewhere, so when you need to go back and remind yourself of something, it's, it's there, right? So I'll show you some blog posts that are just a few lines that I just want to remember. Okay, but, but so far, so this has all been for myself, and this is actually the, the main reason I blog, it's because it, it benefits me. Okay. But I do also do it for other reasons. And so one is, the number one reason is to be useful to others. And so again, for example, if you, know, you, you sit with some problem, how do I do this? How do I make YouTube do this? Or how do I fix my faucet at home? Or something like that. I Google it, right? And I don't know about you, but I have saved tons of time because I've just, someone was kind enough to put something up and say, this is how you do it. And then you do it and it works. Like, how do I make Word do this? Or what the tech command do I use for this symbol? Right? Someone was kind enough to, right? They wrote it down for themselves, but then they were kind enough to put it up on the internet. Right? Um, another uh, thing that's related is just, the idea of, of sharing. So my feeling is that I'm paid by the taxpayers, so I don't really make anything that's sold. Right? So the reason I get money uh, in my bank account every month is because I'm paid to figure something out. So I'm also paid to teach, right? and I share that. 
but I'm also paid to figure something out to do research. Right? And so that's only useful if I share it. So I should share it, right? Because someone else paid me to, to do this, to find it out. So that's my, my personal opinion on this. Uh, and that is also connected with then with being open. So in, in my I, I practice what's called open science. So the idea is that you, you basically you share what you find out, right? Because that's sort of the purpose of being a scientist. And so all scientists share when they write papers, right? But that's sort of the end product, right? What about all the other stuff, <coughs> right? The, maybe the stuff that didn't work, or maybe you're, you're writing a paper five years after you did the research because things got in the way and then you had to wait for somebody to do an experiment and then the person in charge of writing this section got sick. You know, it's five years can go very fast, right? And so during those five years, this stuff is just lying around on some hard disk, not helping anyone. So my feeling is that it, it should be out there because other people have paid for me to get this information, to find this information out. Okay, so this is some sort of very general things. So let me show you some, some examples of what I mean. <laughs> So here is an example of where I'm trying to get something straight in my head. Uh, and it's about where I should send my, what journal, to what journal should I send my next paper. And so the reason I started writing this is because, um, so this is a few years ago, right? I was starting to think about open science and one aspect of open science is open access, right? So the, if you pick, uh, traditional journal, um, it's not accessible by the people who paid for the research. So your uncle who paid his taxes and contributed to your research cannot read about the research. Right? If they go, you download many papers, but if you try to do this from home, right, you're, you're blocked. Uh, most journals now will allow you to buy or to rent an article, you know, for maybe you can rent it for ten dollars and buy it for thirty dollars, right? But in my well, what I was thinking about is, is that really is that right, right? Because people have already paid for the research, and now they also have to pay to read about it. Um, but of course, so so there are journals where you pay, you pay the publisher, and then they publish the paper, and then everyone can read it. Right, so that's open access. <clears throat> and so, um, should I start publishing in open access? And this is something I thought about for a long time. Uh, and so, well, what are the reasons for? I've just outlined some of the reasons. Uh, but there's a lot of reasons against also, at least in principle. Right, so a lot of, the open access journals, and this is, you know, almost four years ago, or more than four years ago now, um, were journals that were not well recognized, right? So I usually would publish in something like uh, Journal of Chemical Physics or Journal of Physical Chemistry or something like that. Um, and so that's what I had on my CV. If I now start publishing in, for example, Plus One, which is one of the open access journals, is that going to make my CV look bad? Is that going to hurt my chances of getting funding? Uh, is that going to hurt my chances of getting promoted? Uh, those were some considerations. Other considerations were, well, again, why do I publish in Journal of Physical Chemistry? How did I choose that? Right, so th these are the thoughts I'm going through here. Right? I never really thought about it before. I just, that's what I do. Why do I do this? Well. A lot of other related papers to my research are published in Journal of Physical Chemistry. Uh, do people find my work if I don't publish it in Journal of Physical Chemistry? Will I get citations if I don't publish in Journal of Physical Chemistry? Will I get good reviews? Will the editor pick the right reviewers? And things like that. And so, 
<clears throat> a lot of stuff sort of going around in my head, right, over many, many months. And so I finally just sat down and addressed every point to sort of get it straight in my head. <coughs> and actually, the, the biggest conclusion, which I would never have gotten to if I hadn't written it down, was actually very simple. It's just, I'm not committing myself to only publishing open access for the rest of my life, <coughs> right? Let's, that's too big a question. Right? And there's actually no reason to make that promise. What I'm thinking about is where am I going to send my next paper? The one I have almost done. That's a much easier question to answer. And so that's sort of what I finally, <coughs> the point I got to. And once I made that discovery or whatever you want to call it, then okay, <coughs> the next paper is going to plus one. And let's see what happens. Let's do an experiment. But I, I, I'm almost 100% sure if I hadn't sat down and written it down, then I probably would have said, nah, it's best not to, you know, there's too many unanswered questions. Let's just send it to the general physical chemistry. And <coughs> that's what I would have done. Right? Just because if, there, if there's too many unanswered questions, can't really figure it, see your way through it, then it's best to do what you normally do. Okay. So, so blogging here is a good way of doing that. Yeah? Can you send it to both? Uh, not at the same time. There are, there, the, the people would get very upset if they figured out that you had submitted to multiple journals at the same time. Can anyone think of a reason why that is? I mean, I would get in serious trouble. In fact, you have to, you have to sign, when you send in papers, you have to sign a statement saying, I have not sent this to any other journal. Why, why do you think that is? Why is that a big deal? Yeah? Oh, I would get in, if, if both were accepted, and I put both on my CV, then that's malpractice. That's, I could get fired for that. Yeah. Okay, so we're not even talking about that. What we're talking about is, you, you could imagine, you know, let's just see who accepts it first, right? And then I just, speak, I just say, tell the other journal, never mind. <coughs> that's also very bad. I would get in serious trouble. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah? Yes. For who? I mean, not for me. I've already, I, ha I can make two copies. Yes, so people have to peer review it, and editors have to handle it. Right? And so imagine when you review an article, I usually spend at least a couple of hours, and sometimes more if it's a complicated paper. Right? So imagine I somehow figured out that someone had sent something out to five journals. Imagine I got the same paper to review <laughs> from two different journals. But let's just imagine that I figured I just wasted two hours right, reviewing this paper. And that review is not going to be used because the other journal said yes a little earlier. OK, I get really mad. And I'll write a blog post about it. <coughs> right. And the editor would get really mad. And the editor <coughs> would probably say, don't send any papers here ever again, I would imagine. So, so no, you can't. You have to decide. Um, now, of course, if that paper, if that journal rejects it, then you're free to send it to another journal. But, uh, but I have to, I mean, again, here we have class one, right? Let's say I send it in, and it gets upset, accepted. Then I can't say, oh, I changed my mind. I mean, unless there's an error in the paper or something like that. All right? Again, the editor would get seriously mad. So I, when I send it in, I make the commitment, right? Saying, if you accept this, then yes, you'll publish my paper. And so it's, it's kind of a big decision to do it. So you have to be sure when you send it in. Okay. And so then you say, okay, well, why didn't I just put it in the Word document? And just, okay, I have it, it's straight in my head now, I'm sending it to plus one. What's the advantage of putting it up on the, on the web? Yeah? Yeah, and so why, why might that be particularly important for, for this kind of thing? 
Yeah. Yeah. And and what what could they tell me? I mean. I, what what I'm worried about here so sort of is this going to hurt my career? All right. So if people wrote back saying I've been publishing in plus one for ten years and nothing bad happened to me, that would be really valuable information. Right. But the other thing, more generally, is what does it mean to hurt my career? Right. What does it mean that my CV looks bad? <coughs> well, who does it look bad to? It looks bad to it looks bad to other scientists. Right? So I have some arguments here for why it's not a big deal, right? But I want other scientists, if other scientists say, I wouldn't do that, if I get a CV with nothing but plus one articles, you know, I wouldn't call you in for an interview. That would be really valuable information. So, for, so, so this is, a, I put this up as an example where, well, here you really do need the input because what you're worried of, you're worried about what your colleagues will think. So the only way to figure that out is to, is to put it up. Now, I could have emailed my Word file to 10 different people and say, what do you think? Right? But here, in principle, you know, everyone can see it. And maybe someone I hadn't thought of would have some really valuable insights. So OK, now, for, I can't remember, but for this particular one, I don't think I got any feedback. All right, but I still got it straight in my head. <laughs> uh, here's another one. Uh, so this is from this uh, journal club blog. Uh, and so this is basically just a, a summary of what the paper is about and why it's important. <coughs> so. So the idea is that you, you pick something, the idea is you pick papers that are really interesting and make other people aware of it. But it's also, you know, why, why is this interesting? Okay, it looked interesting, you know, so I have a, a folder uh, that belongs to this blog and if I see an interesting title or an interesting abstract or if I see a lot of people tweet about it or something, we'll get to that, then I put it in the folder. Right? And then once a month, I pick, I pick a paper up uh, and write about it. OK, there's one, it's one thing to read the abstract and say, OK, that looks interesting. Right? But to really understand what the paper is about, right? you have to be able to write a summary. If it's straight enough in your head, right, you should be able to write it down. So this forces me to read the paper thoroughly. I can't do this with every paper. Right, because it takes a little bit of time. But I'm doing it with the important papers. Right, so I get it straight in my head. And also what I've found is that I remember it a lot better. Then, then what do we normally do? We just read the abstract, maybe the conclusion, say, OK, that's a keeper, and put it in the fold. Right, and then there's a whole other extreme where there's a paper very central to our research, and we read every word because they do almost exactly what we're doing. Right? This is something in between, where it's potentially, it's, it's interesting and potentially useful in the future. Okay, so I get it straight in my head, but I also remember it. So years later, actually, so I've done this for, <coughs> for a while now, I actually find that I can remember. I can't remember all the details, but I'm, you know, again, you're sitting and writing a proposal, and you said, okay, here's my method. And now you have to think of some application, a right, future application. And you think, well, there was a paper two years ago that this might actually be really useful for. Okay, and that's a paper that I've written up here. And then I can go back and read what what did I think that was so interesting about it. But that's actually not the important part. The important part is that I remember it. Right. So the act of writing helps you remember. So it's not really that it's, not only is it sort of straight on paper, but it also becomes straight in your head, and that <coughs> means you can remember it a lot better. And that's been really useful. Also, you're, you, know, you talk to 
or you're trying to solve some some problem and you're completely stuck and you say, well, I read, you know, three years ago, I read a paper that was about something like that. Okay, so that is, that's incredibly useful. So just, again, the act of writing, and again, this doesn't have to be public, right? You could just, you could have done the same thing in the Word file and it would still stick in your head. Okay, but the act of writing, solidifies it in your head. Uh, and so then, you know, well, okay, but why not put it up, right? It might be useful to some other people. And I think eventually you're gonna, you're gonna just feel silly writing in the Word file all the time. And then saving it somewhere. But also here, I mean, I think it's interesting. Do other people think it's interesting? That might be useful to know. Is there a flaw in this? Yes, it's interesting, but in fact, it's, there's an error, right? The only way you find out is to put it out there. Uh, actually, let me just go back. Um, so there's another, another reason for doing this, and that's helping others. And so as, as, well, as you may or may not know, you may have talked about this, right? The number of papers, scientific papers, is growing like crazy. So there are more scientists and we're more productive. It's easier to generate data. There's a lot of papers. Okay, and, and you know, when I started as a PhD student, it, it, I think it's correct to say that if you uh, looked at the table of contents of about 10 journals, right, and these journals came out once a month, okay, you could probably with confidence say that you know what's happening in the field. Right, by looking at these 10 tables of content. And you had to do that about once a month. But now, that's impossible. There's no area of, of science or no area of research or research project where you can point at 10 journals and say, if I just keep up with those, I'll be fine. Okay, and you have to remember that for a lot of these journals, they come out every week. Okay, and there's a lot more papers in these journals than there used to be. It's, it's impossible. So how are we going to solve this? How are we going to keep up to date with what's happening? Right? And so one way is to crowdsource it. Right? If everyone goes out and say, you know, reads a couple of papers every week, and every month say, OK, here's probably the most interesting one. Right? Then all of a sudden, we have a lot fewer papers to look at. <laughs> because you have all scientists sort of helping you filter all these, this vast amount of information. Okay? And so this is sort of my contribution to this. Right? It helps me just getting it straight in, the, in my head and so forth. But in the future, if other people do this and other people are doing this, right, it also helps me. There's fewer papers that I have to read to find the important ones. So that's another reason for putting it out there publicly. And then there's the feedback, which I've mentioned. Uh, and so usually I don't get any feedback. Uh, but here's, here's an example. And so another point I want to make in all of this is that you just, you never know. It's impossible to predict when something is going to be useful. But here's one. So I'm, our DKID is a software package um, in Python, and I'm trying to teach myself how to do this for, for a research project. And so, you know, I write a little bit of code, and instead of just leaving it in a folder, I share it. Okay, and here's the, here's the blog post. It's, it's these three lines, comments, welcome, and then the code I just sort of pasted. So it took a while to figure this out, okay? But writing the blog post took a minute. Okay, and so here's the comment section. This is the guy who wrote RD Kit. He's the world expert on RD Kit. And he wrote back saying, well, in this line further down, I would suggest you use this. Okay, that's, that's gold. I mean, that's expert advice. Uh, 
how did he find it? Well, that's actually through Twitter, which we'll talk about. So I wrote my blog post, and then I tweeted that I wrote my blog post. And instead of writing RD kit, I put a little ad in front. Right? So the RD kit Twitter account, he obviously reads that. He went back and looked. He took the time to, to write a comment that's going to make my research better. So, OK, but I never, I just put it up. Right? If, if you try to judge, this is likely to get feedback. This isn't likely to get feedback. I would never have put this up. You just never know. So the, the more you share, the, the, the more the chances are <coughs> that you will get some feedback. But it's hard to predict. Let me see. There was another one. Oh. Yeah, actually, so this, let me just, this is related to this. Uh, here's another one. This is a little bit, yeah, related to RD Kit, but on something, there's not even, there's a little bit of code, but, but it was just a, a very, very, very specific problem. Now, I'm not even going to explain it, but it was something very specific we're trying to do with RD Kit, and I wrote a little prototype code that did it. And, and frankly, uh, this is actually one where, so this is not that long ago. I still remember, should I even put that up there? Because this, you know, this is not going to be of interest to anyone because it's so specific. Okay. And then I did it anyway, right? And a few days later, I get a PhD student writing me saying he's not working on exactly the same thing, but something interesting, something similar. And he saw this blog post, he's worked through the code, and he has a few questions. OK, I would just, so this might help him. I, have, I would never in a million years have predicted this. But you just, you, you never know. So it's, if, if you just put it up as a matter of habit, right, you get things happen in the end. Things, people find it with Google. So this was very useful to him. Ah, okay. Um, here's an example to remember something, right? And so this is literally a note to myself. This is how I did. I knew I was going to forget this. I, I spent a Saturday morning working this out, and I was going to use it in a couple of weeks <laughs> for a paper. And I just knew I was going to forget how to do this, right? And so I just I literally wrote this to myself, okay, with all these steps. Maybe this will be a use or something. Maybe not, right? It's, it's impossible. I don't have any feedback now, but two years from now, someone could be trying to do the same thing, find the blog post, save some time, maybe do things a little better, and leave a comment. Uh, here's one uh, to be useful to others. So this is from the, uh, the other blog. Um, and this is how to use some program in quantum chemistry. And so I knew all that, and it was straight in my head. I just knew other people had trouble with it from bulletin boards and things like that. And so I just wrote this post just to be of use for others, right? because I spent my PhD using this, this, uh, this program, and so I knew it inside and out. Uh, and so that has, uh, until a few days ago, 26,000 people have looked at this. Okay, so this. Didn't take me that long to write. A lot of people have gotten used to this. That one we talked about. Uh, and OK, so here's one sort of more to share. Right? So I publish almost all my papers now open access. <clears throat> and so in principle, people, you know, my mom can read this in principle. She can download it. and. She won't hit a paywall, okay, but she's not going to be able to understand. Um, and so I actually started, uh, whenever a new paper comes out, is really to write it, try to write it in a way that everyone will understand. So not, and that's really hard, okay, because you constantly want to use terms, you know, or you take something for granted and things like that. Uh, and so this was actually, so I did this actually initially as a sort of a public service, right? Because people have paid for this research. 
and they should be able to, I should take half an hour, 45 minutes of my time and just try to explain it to the people who paid for it. But it actually turned out that this was really valuable for me again because if you really try to, this is kind of the thing you have to do when you write a proposal anyway, right? There's the, the proposal is sent in, there's some board of non-experts, and they have to decide whether, or at least get a feeling of whether this is important. And they actually won't know a lot of these terms anyway either. So this, really, this is a, was actually a really good exercise for writing proposals. And in fact, it was, I would say it's even sort of further in the sense that you start to think bigger. Right? The first thing you realize when, when you have to, when someone asks you, what do you do? Some, some, you know, it's a Christmas lunch and your niece asks you what you're doing. And you say, well, that's really hard to explain. Right? But, I, you know, I work on electron transfer and metalloproteins. Right? Not very satisfying, right? For anyone, <laughs> you or them. Okay. And, but if you sit down and really sort of think about it, and, and write it out and get it straight in your head. The problem with explaining what you're doing, at least what I've found, is that you're trying to explain what you're doing. And that's actually not what they're asking. Right? They're asking what kind of problem are you working on and why is it important? Right? So what kind of general problem? Right? So for example, um, I wrote some paper and it, it has to do with the um, well, the PKA prediction. There's some technical things that make it faster and all that stuff. But this sort of really forced me to, in the end, right, if you sort of take big things like climate and energy and green, energy, or green chemistry, and where does it fit in? And so it actually, in the end, fit into drug design. So in the end, I'm actually doing this to make better drugs. I will never make a drug in my life, right? But at some point, someone in, let's say, a drug company might actually use not what I just published, right, but what this research might lead to in five years, right? They would actually, they could potentially use that to make a better drug, right, by figuring out whether the, the drug is charged or neutral at the pH where it's administered. And that's really the, that's really the answer your niece wants. Right. And so what you find is that, so here, this is not the full blog post, right? <coughs> but when I write these, you know, two-thirds of it is background. It has nothing specifically to do with this paper. And the last third is a little bit about the paper, right? Three or four lines, right? So the background is much more important than what you actually did. When you have to explain it, you have to describe the background and then in three or four sentences just say, well, how does this, in this big field, how does this advance it a little bit? And that's also exactly what you have to do in an application, in a, in a grant application. Right? It's the first page that's important before you ever really talk about the details of what you're going to do. That's, it's the big picture. Why, where does this fit into the big picture? And why is this big picture important? Okay. But I sort of I realized this later, right? So it started sort of as a as a public service. Okay, but again, so we keep coming back to this helped me in the end by getting something straight in my head that I didn't here I wasn't even trying to ask a question, right? But just by struggling with it and writing it down. Right? You come to this realization that, well, it's, it's in this case, the, it's the background that's important <coughs> for these kind of things. It's not what I'm actually doing. It's what I'm trying to help other people do that's important in this context. So thinking by writing. Uh, okay, and so here's one. This is just to be open. So <laughs> when you share, you really share, right? So uh, these are my reviews. These are the anonymous reviews of a paper I sent in. So I didn't write this, right? But they sent it to me, and now I'm sharing it. What did other people think about my work? 
Um, and so why, why might that be a, a good idea to do, other than just for the principle of being open? What, what could I possibly gain by this, by making my videos? Public. Or is that just a bad idea? Would you do it? Did you send in a paper and you got reviews back? Well, I can tell you, so one reason, I mean, I do it really just to be open, but one reason is, for example, one of the critiques of plus one, uh, this is actually not in plus one, this is in some other place. One critique as well, you know, they don't really, they don't send it really out to experts, right? They don't really know the field, so they don't pick the right experts. And so the reviews are kind of, you know, not so critical. And it's easy to publish in plus one. And you can say, well, no, that's not true. Right? But you can also show them what I got a review back, right? I think it's written by an expert. You can be the judge. I think it is. And it's just as long and detailed and everything as in my Journal of Physical Chemistry. So if you think that I, it's easy to publish in plus one or QJ, well, here's, here's what I got back. You think that's easy? Uh, how does that compare to the reviews you're getting? Right? So by being open, it's, it's one way to sort of uh, address critique up front. Ah, okay. So we're going to do some exercise, but actually, I didn't think I was going to talk for this long. So I've talked for 45 minutes now, so uh, we have two minutes for questions, and then I think we should have a break. So are there any sort of questions in general? So, is this something you'd want to do, Vlog? Or is this something you would do to get something straight in your head? You would sort of write down arguments for and against? Or would you write down something just to see if it's clear in your head? Well, why don't you talk about that during the break, and then we can sort of we can start by discussing that when we come back. So we start again at, at 15 minutes after. <laughs>